while back, Sports Illustrated had an article on John Madden. And as some of you know, John Madden has had the fear of flying, hasn't been on a plane since 1979. However, this was going to make it difficult, if not impossible, to continue having a career in broadcasting. So here's what he said. He said, I had three options. I could quit what I was doing on television. That was one option. Two, I could get professional help, see a therapist and all that. And third option, I could change my way of traveling, which is what he decided to do. So for 30 years, John Madden went by bus back and forth across our country from San Francisco to New York City, from Miami to Green Bay, literally hundreds of thousands of miles on a bus because he felt that was a better, more social, socially acceptable way of dealing with his fear as opposed to going to counseling and then overcoming that fear and then flying every place, which would be a lot easier. Of course, he said he didn't have a fear of flying. He actually had a fear of crashing, which I guess is, makes sense. Now, I know I've told you this story before, but this is a true story. Michael and Megan were there, and they're here still, right here on the front row. <clears throat> a really scary experience during one of our vacations. We were down uh, near Cancun, and we went to this water park type swimming place, and they had a place right near the ocean. It was a pool, though, where you could swim with sharks. They said they were baby sharks. So I'm thinking, baby, you know, baby sharks, right? So we get there to the actual place, and these, these sharks are like three, four, or five feet long. But I've already, already told my kid, Daddy's not afraid. I'll swim with those baby sharks. <laughs> and so I get in this, this giant pool, and there are sharks. There are those uh, manta rays or the, also everywhere. And you could reach out and touch them. They were really close. They said not to touch them. Like, yeah, I was real tempted. <clears throat> but honest with you, I mean, it, it, I, I felt a lot of fear. I really did. I had shortness of breath. My pulse rate doubled. I had the overwhelming desire to shout out four-letter words like mama or something like that. It was scary. Seriously. But of course, there's a big difference between the fear of flying and the fear of sharks than most of the fears that we face these days because you can avoid those. Just never get on a plane or never go near the ocean, and neither one of those things are going to happen to you. But a lot of our fears, there's really, we have very little or no control over. You know, like cancer, losing your job, something happening to one of your kids or your grandkids, you know, serious financial shortages, a lot of things that come in our lives that we, we do fear, we have worries and concerns about. In many case, cases, we had limited or maybe even no control in those situations. Now, when I was growing up, I don't recall my mother being much of a worrier. I don't ever remember her saying, be careful, when I left the house. Uh, I don't remember her staying awake, you know, if I got home late. I don't ever remember that. When I turned 16, two months later, my parents let me drive by myself from Miami, Oklahoma to Cincinnati, Ohio. It was a 12-hour drive. I had my license for six weeks at that time. However, as she got older, I noticed that I would go over to her house, and she would be watching TV, and she would say, did you hear about that plane crash in Russia? Or all oh, those poor people in Japan, they were killed in that earthquake. Or did you hear about the latest ISIS attack in the Middle East? I think people do wor worry more as we get older, especially watching the news. I mean, bad things have always happened around the world, but now every abduction, every mining disaster, every tribal conflict, every car wreck, every act of aggression is right there happening in our living rooms in living color, you know, on high-definition 60-inch TVs. It, I think it makes the world seem like a scarier place than it really is. Well, today as we continue our series, Jesus' Greatest Hits, Jesus addresses one of the problems that has plagued the human race since the beginning of time, worry and anxiety. And let me just ask you straight out here to begin with, are you a worrier? Have people said, yeah, they're a worry wart, those kinds of terms that we use. Are you a worrier? And if you are, do you believe it's possible to maybe worry less, to become less of a worrier than you are? In other words, I mean, no matter what Jesus says in the verses that we're talking about today, does it really have the potential to make a difference in your life, to cause you to worry significantly less than you currently do? 
You think that's possible? Because if not, there's really not a lot of point in me doing this talk or you listening to it. So I hope that we all will believe it is possible. Now, I want to ask you to do something today, uh, not stand up like we did at the end of the service last week, but I want to ask for you to get the most of this, I want to ask you to do something. Find a piece of paper near you, it could be the back of your announcement sheet, all right? Find a piece of paper and borrow a pen if you don't have one, and I want to give you just a moment here, just a second, to identify in your mind and write down the two or three biggest worries or concerns in your life right now. If you don't want to write it down, that's fine. You can just kind of think about this in your mind. What are the first things that come to mind when you think the things I worry about, things that are stressing me out these days, the things that maybe I fear about my future? Take a moment right now, and I just identify the top one or two or three that come to mind when you think about the biggest worries or concerns that tend to just, you know, plague me on a regular basis in your life right now. You know, I think as we go through life, it seems like there are two kinds of people in this world. There are worriers. And then there are those people who don't seem like they have a worry in the world. A lot of us fall into that first category. We know all about that you know, pervasive emotion of worry that causes us to anticipate the worst, to be filled with anxiety, to toss and turn at night. And we don't really like it, but the truth about of us is that, that we're worriers. Other people seemingly don't have a worry. They walk into a room and they seem to ooze confidence. They take on challenges that leave most people weak need. They seem secure, virtually worry-free. Tom Brady seems like that kind of guy to me. What does he have to, be, to worry about? He makes a ton of money from football and endorsements. His wife is a supermodel. She makes more than him. He's one of the best ever at what he does. He's won six Super Bowls and four Super Bowl MVPs. Well, Tom Brady, in an interview, said, here are some things that he worries about. He says, I worry about the safety of my children. I worry about being a good father and a good husband. And I worry about all the concussions I've had and how they might change my life at age 50 and beyond. You know, in reality, all of us are worriers. Some a lot, others is not so much. But we all are familiar with this thing called anxiety. You know, as much as life has changed on planet Earth over the past 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, much less a thousand years or two thousand years, Jesus talked about issues that are timeless. They are relevant in every culture, on every continent of the, of the planet, in every era of human history. People all over the world in the past and still today struggle with worry and anxiety. Poor people worry, rich people worry, men worry, women worry, Africans, Chinese, uh, you know, Americans, people in every country, continent, city, village on this planet worry about things. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something else. This will just take a second. Everybody put your hands together like this, okay? All right. How many of you have your left, thing, left thumb on top? Say yes. yes. How many have your right thumb on top? Say yes. yes. About even, all right? Now, switch it and do it the opposite way. How does that feel? That feels really weird. Feels really uncomfortable because it is a, what's it? It's a habit. We do it this way by habit. We don't consciously think, oh, put your fingers together. You didn't have to go, wait a minute. Uh, you know, we, we just do this, right? It's a habit we've developed over a very long period of time. And, you know, worry is a habit. Worry is a habit. Now, what if someone was to tell you, I'm going to give you $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars, if you will change how you do your hands when you put them together? They said, I will give you $250,000 if you do change that on a permanent basis. That's the way you always do it. Would you be willing to put out the effort, maybe put little reminders around and stuff like that? Always put my, th you know, because if they catch you doing it the other way, they're not going to give you the money. I think most of us would go, I would be willing to feel uncomfortable for a little while. That would be worth, that would be worth the effort. Well, for some of us, 
the automatic response to life that we have, we just automatically respond to life with worry. It's a habit. We catastrophize, which is irrational thinking that causes us to believe that something is far worse than it probably actually is going to be. And I think all of us would agree that worry and anxiety do not enhance our lives. Instead, they worry and, and anxiety tends to rob us of happiness and peace. So let's look at what Jesus has to say about it. He gives four arguments against worry. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. As James said, well, that's a good one right there. Uh, but how do we do it? Things like what to eat or what, to, what you wear. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not, are you not much more valuable than they? Jesus' argument, number one against worry, is that human beings are far more valuable than birds. Now, I realize that is lively debated among spotted owl lovers in our culture. You know, don't want to kill all the spotted owls. They're important. But Jesus contends that God watches over the birds. Certainly, only take care of his children. Now, you think about it. If anybody is on God's welfare rolls, it's the birds. They don't really do a heck of a whole lot. They stand around. They fly from here to there, which we'd all love to fly. They get to do that. They eat. They don't really help anybody. They don't contribute to society. And yet, as insignificant as birds are, Jesus says God takes care of them and provides for them. Jesus is saying, you know, that's good enough for birds just to know that God's loving watch care is over them. So birds don't develop, develop ulcers or high blood pressure. Birds don't need alcohol to help them cope. Birds don't de develop type A personalities that put them on the brink of nervous breakdowns. Now, the Sea of Galilee was, and still is today, the crossroads of bird migration in that area of Israel. And in all likelihood, Jesus perhaps saw a flock of birds flying overhead and said to the warriors, then and now, relax. Your Heavenly Father manages the whole ecosystem in such a way as to make sure that every little bird gets enough to drink and enough to eat. Birds matter. They're wonderful. They're valuable. However, Jesus would say, you are of infinite more value to God than all the birds in the world combined. No bird has ever been made in the image of God, but you were. And if God, pain, God painstakingly exercises his loving, providing, protective watch care over birds, you know, how much more will he take care of you? So, conclusion, don't worry. Jesus' second spin on worry is that human beings have a far longer lifespan than flowers. Why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers grow wild in the fields? They don't get all stressed out over the missing the latest cell at the mall or whatever. They have enough. And yet Solomon, in all his wealth and splendor, was, was never dressed so majestically. And this is, if this is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into a pile and burned, won't he also take care of you? The point Jesus is making is that flowers don't worry. And very rarely do you see a flower in a big hurry. I mean, think about it. What is the place where flowers live called? A bed. It's a flower bed. They just lay around in a bed and do nothing all the time. They're, it's not called a flower racetrack or a flower expressway. It's just a bed. And when flowers have outlived their usefulness, they're just thrown away. In other words, they're highly discardable, unlike us. And if God goes to great lengths to care for and sustain such highly discardable material, how much more will he care, will he give toward making sure that we, you know, have everything that we need? So if the flowers and the plants don't worry, and the birds and the animals don't worry, and the oceans and the rivers aren't filled with anxiety, and the planets and galaxies don't worry, why should we, who are of infinite more value in God's eyes, why should we worry? Jesus' argument number three against worry, it doesn't really accomplish anything except maybe to make us and the people around us miserable. Who of you, by worrying, can add even a single, a single hour to your life? To worry about something that you can change is kind of futile. You know, if you can, worry, if you, if you can change it, just go change it. To worry about something you can't change, that's kind of futile too because you can't do anything about it. And so worry, in a way, doesn't make any sense. 
Worry is not only unproductive, it can be counterproductive. You know, it's like a rocking chair. It gives you a sense of activity, but you don't really go anywhere. You can't change the past. Worry can't improve the future. All worry does is kind of ruin right now. How often, how much do we have to worry before we realize that it doesn't accomplish anything positive? And here's a word to the worriers among us. Don't open your umbrella until it actually starts raining. In other words, break the habit of anticipating and predicting all kinds of gloom and doom. Don't open the umbrella, at least until it starts raining. The technical term for this kind of thinking is catastrophizing. It's sort of how our mind works to manufacture worst case scenarios. And we all know how that happens. You know, this certain thing takes place, or this thing didn't come through, or this bill is due, and our minds just begin to, to spin, and it creates fears. And it gets us where we can't hardly think straight. And it affects, obviously, how, how we feel inside. That kind of fear, like most things about worry, is unfounded. Several years ago, a doctor named Walter Cabert did a study on worry, and he discovered that only 8% of the things that people worry about were legitimate matters of concern. Eight out of 100. The other 92% were either in our minds, never happened, or things over which people have no control. Only 8%. So out of 100 times that you're worried, 8% of the time might be something legit. Don't open your umbrellas until at least it starts raining. Jesus' fourth argument against worry Christ's followers have a loving Heavenly Father who has promised to take care of us and watch over us. Seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, put God first in your life and then trust Him. Trust Him with the results. This is one of those promises in the Bible that comes with a condition. Jesus says, in a sense, if you will put God first in your life, then you can be sure of God's loving, providing, protective watch, you know, watch care. Implied, if you don't seek God first, then it's kind of on your own. The promise is available to everyone, but only those who seek to put God as their top priority will in, enjoy the benefits of this promise. You know, so to people outside the family of God, it makes perfect sense for them to stress out about their lives. It makes perfect sense for them to fear death. But to those of us who have already entrusted our earthly lives and our eternal souls into God's care, worry is, for the most part, unnecessary. And in a way, it's a contradiction to faith. When a Christian worries, she or he are saying one of three things. One, God doesn't know what's going on in my life. Here I am having problems. Where is God when I need him? We've all felt that, but we've all said that. That's one thing. Or it could be saying, well, God, maybe he knows what's going on in my life, but he obviously doesn't care because he's not doing anything. Or number three, God knows and he cares. He's just powerless to intervene and make any difference. And we all have been down those roads. Worry and faith are kind of counter to one another. And this is especially true in the light of Romans 8, 28. This is the place in the Bible where God has gone on record guaranteeing that we'll, he will take all that happens in your life everything that happens in your life and cause them to somehow, someday, in some ways, work out together for your good. And so what seems like a trial, and it is a trial, but what seems like just a trial and just a disappointment or just a setback to us, in reality, God will in some way, in some day, turn it into a blessing. We've all experienced that on previous problems previous situations, God's faithfulness, and how things he did work out things for our good, but will he on this current one? And that's where we run into problems. This is another one of those that promises with a condition. God doesn't say this guarantee applies to everybody. It applies, Romans 8.28 goes on to say, to all those who love God and are living according to his purposes. And that would be all of us who are aspiring to be Christ followers. You might think about it like this. Worry is basically the opposite of trust. You know, when you're a passenger in a car, you are, in a very real sense, trusting that person who's driving with your life. Right? 
they could make a mistake. They could veer off and hit an embankment. They could drive into oncoming traffic, and just like that, you could be gone. You are entrusting your life to that person, which is really scary when your kids first get their license. You think about that. It's like, I'm putting my hand, you know, no, just try not to think about it. When you go out to eat, you're trusting that someone in the kitchen back there is not going to put poison in your food. You just eat the food, you go like, probably nobody's going to poison me, right? You're trusting them. When you go in for surgery, or you take prescription drugs from the pharmacy, or you board a plane, you are, de you are demonstrating enormous trust. You are entrusting your very life into the hands of other people, often people you don't even know. And people are fallible. You know, we all make mistakes. People screw up. Sometimes people even turn out to not be trustworthy. But obviously, God is not like that. And so, that should help us in our efforts to trust. So what do we know about worry? Well, we know, we all know it's draining emotionally. We know it's limiting. Limiting in how it causes us to look at life. We know it's contagious. And we know that God does not want us to live our lives under the dark clouds of fear and worry. However, is it possible for a person who has a worry problem, a worry habit, you know, a major league catastrophizer, catastrophizer who always sees the glasses half empty and whose auto response to life to wor is worry, can a person like that really experience some positive change? I believe that we can. And I think part of the key is to memorize a verse from the Bible that speaks directly to the particular worry that you have. Be it a financial worry, family worry, a health worry, whatever it might be. Here are just a few examples. Philippians 4 says, Do not be anxious, but instead pray and tell it to God, and he will bring peace into your heart. Isaiah 26 says that God will keep in perfect peace the person who keeps their mind focused and fixed on God and who trusts in the Lord in all circumstances because he is the rock eternal. That is the foundational, bedrock foundation of experiencing true inner peace is knowing that your life, your soul, your future are in God's strong and capable hands. Here's another great familiar passage, Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways put him first and he will take care of you. Seek first the kingdom of God, as we just talked about. Put him first and all the material things. I mean, who among us doesn't sometimes have financial worries and fear? This addresses it specifically. You worry about, what am I going to eat? What am I? We don't worry about that so much, but we worry about financial things. These bills are coming through, or retirement is coming, and I don't have enough money, and this and so on and so forth. You know, he says, seek first the kingdom of God. You know, you got to do your due diligence. You have to do your part that you can do in these things. But then you trust God to make things fall into place. There's a lot of similar ones. Why not pick one, write it on several post-it notes, and then put them everywhere you see things on a regular basis, like on your bathroom mirror, maybe on the dash of your car. You could change your computer uh, monitor the screensaver to be one of these verses, your phone screensaver to be one of these verses, put one on your bed table at night where you see it first thing in the morning and the last thing in the evening, till you own that verse. And that verse begins to own you. Remember how comfortable it feels to put your hands together the way you always have? And then how weird and strange it was to do it a new way? Well, if worry has been sort of your default mode, if worry comes natural and easy for you, even though it's bad for you, you're kind of comfortable with it, right? Well, you can decide to go through the rest of your life like that, or you could decide to put a stake in the ground and say, this has to change. Maybe I'll never have perfect peace in my heart, but I've got to have more than I have. I have to trust God more than I do. And you have to grind through the development of a new habit. 
It's worth more than the $250,000 someone would have paid you to reverse how you do your hands in the long run. I'm going to tell you guys, I didn't write, actually write this down. I kind of debated whether I'd have enough time to do it, but I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, <clears throat> so when I don't say things that are on my notes, it's usually a bad idea. Okay, I'm just going to try to do it anyway without saying something inappropriate. <clears throat> Okay, so about 12 years ago, you know, terrible stuff happened in my life, in the church, whatever. And ap in the immediate aftermath of that, when my mind would go there, which it did often, every day, my first response, a feeling would be either being dumbfounded, dumbfounded that it happened, and just sh shocked and dismayed that these things, these kind of things could happen. Uh, there was a part of me, I'm not an angry person, but there was a part of me that felt anger and resentment. And I didn't want to feel that way. I was, actually was, felt, felt happy in a way that it's like, the man, the, the, the suffering is over. You know, I, I'm let out of, of prison and I'm free now and things can be so much better and I get to spend time with Jen and the kids and I have an actual life again. And so it was not meeting with my reality, but this is where my mind would go. And so for several months, it kind of continued that way. And I finally decided, I said, every time that comes into my mind, the first words in my, out, out my, mind, in my mind and out of my mouth are going to be, thank God, thank you, Lord, that you have rescued me from that. Thank you, God, that that is in the past. That is not in the present. It's not in the future. And so it took me about a month or two. But every, and I wrote it just like I'm telling you guys, I wrote it everywhere I could my office, in my car, in the mirror, in my notebook, in my schedule. Every time I wanted to look, thank you, Lord, rather than my mind going to this negative place, thank you, God. And it changed. It truly, truly changed. And in a matter of about a month or a month and a half, I, when my mind went there, it immediately went to the happy place because it was a happy place. I was so much better off. And... That's why I, I do believe this can happen. I do believe this can work. And when I have fears and worries now, I still do sometimes, I go to the same kind of thing. I just like, I tr I'm trusting you, God. You know, my trust is in you. I just write something like that everywhere. You know, my trust is in you. Lord, I'm putting my trust in you. Every time that negative thought comes in, I want to have a response to it. A biblical response, like a verse, or just, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I don't have the answer, but, I, you know, I'm trusting you. My life is in your hands. So that, you know, that faith has got to well up inside of me if I continue to say that over and over. You know, I read where someone said this. I thought this was really good. You know, when you feel like you haven't accomplished very much in life or your life didn't go the way you wanted or you're in a situation in life like, God, I never thought my life would wind up like this. Someone said the true meaning of the true measure of success in life is winding up in heaven someday. No matter what you go through in life, good or bad or whatever, if you wind up in heaven someday, you won. You navigated life successfully. No matter what anybody else or you think, that is the ultimate measure of success, is that you wind up in heaven forever. But in the meantime, I would encourage you to come up with a scripture, part of a scripture, something you know is a true statement. Lord, my life is in your hands. Lord, that situation is in your hands. I've done all I can do. I'm trusting you. And just answer your fear and your anxieties with that truth. And in time, I think you'll see your heart and your feelings start to match up with the fact that you can trust God and that your life is in God's hands. All right, why don't we stand? We'll have our prayer. Lord, I know that as we gather together like this, that James and Buddy and Kellyanne and Kim and myself and every person in this room, if we name every person in this room, we all have fears 
and anxieties that come our way, and some that seem to come back, and they plague us for long times. Fears about our family, financial fears, health fears, fears of being alone, fears of the future. Or today as a church family, we just want to come together and remind ourselves that you can be trusted. You're the sovereign God of the universe. You care about us. You know what we're going through. You have the power to do things. Lord, may our trust in you increase. And when we fail and falter, we'll be like the guy that Jesus said to Jesus, Lord, I'm trying to trust you. I'm trying to trust you. Help increase my trust. Increase my faith. Lord, I pray that some of us would maybe try to take on something that has plagued us for a long time and try to answer it with your words, your words of truth from Scripture, that we can trust you. You are our rock foundation. You are the beginning and the end. You understand everything. Your knowledge is more than we can ever grasp. And that we can trust you. It's like little kids. We want our kids to trust us. Everything's going to be okay. And you as our Heavenly Father. How much you must long for us to trust you. And to not go through life. Scattered, discouraged, worried. So Lord, help us. Help us to learn to trust you more. Lord, with the things that we wrote down. Are identified in our minds. But right now, those are the things we need your help. Give us faith. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody. Glad you were here today. We'll see you next Sunday.